theyeshiva.net. Okay, thank you very much for your kind words, for your introductory remarks. Thank you to the whole community, to all the sponsors, to all of the Askanim, for the schus, the privilege, and the invitation to be here with this uh, special community of Sha'irith Israel. And I am extremely honored and thrilled to be here with you, especially during these very powerful, meaningful, inspiring days of Dirshu Hashem Bihi Motzai Kru'u Biyose Karev. As the Gemara says in Rosh Hashanah, Elo Aseris Yamim Shabain Rosh Hashanah Liyem Akipurim, when the Rebbeinu Shalolam says, Search for me because I am uniquely present and accessible. During these days, these days of hiskarvos, these days of such intimate closeness, of such a powerful relationship, as the Mikobolim call it, Kiruv HaMoyer El Anitzutz, the time that the spark is so close to the Moyer, to the source of all the light. So it's uniquely a befitting time to learn, to be mechazek each other, to be here together, to grow together, and to delve into words of Torah, Avoidah Gemilas, and works of Gemilas Chasadim. So I really appreciate um, the opportunity. And again, as uh, David mentioned, at the end of the presentation, we will open up the forum to any questions you would like. You could type in your question and neder, I will look at all the questions and uh, for a few moments at least try to respond at least to some of them or maybe most of them. Be'ezer Hashem, neder, and you can ask any question you would like and we're going to try to respond to it. I want to especially acknowledge and begin Birishus, the Marida Asra, Harav Agon, Reb Yaakov, Hapfer Shlita, your dedicated spiritual leader and one of the great spiritual luminaries of Baltimore and Maryland and American Jewry, Abrishus Derov, Shlita, and Abrishus, all of the Rabbonim <coughs> and all of the leaders of the community and the entire community. I am uh, honored to begin my words of this annual Truvid Russia here in uh, Sha'irith, Israel. Allow me to begin with a startling story. In Gemara, in Meseches Chagiga, the second parak of Chagiga, Dav Tesvav, the Gemara tells an incredible story about a man who in Jewish history came to be known as Acher, which means the other one. And we know, we know that from hundreds of Tanayim and Amirayim, an era that spans hundreds of years of Jewish history, we only have a record of one who left Judaism, who became what we would call a heretic. And this is none other than Elisha ben Avuya, one of the greatest sages of his time, a teacher and colleague of Rabbi Akiva, a teacher of Reb Meir, Reb Meir upon whom the Gemara says in Erev and Dafyud Gimel, some of you learned it just a few weeks ago, that Layardu Chachamim Lamed al Saif Daitai, the sages of the time couldn't appreciate the depth of Reb Meir's wisdom. And this is his teacher, Elisha ben Avuya. And yet he abandoned the Jewish faith, he abandoned Jewish tradition, he became an accomplice to the Romans. Gemara says, Kitzet Benetius, he became a heretic. And one day, Taner Rabbanon, the rabbis teach us, uh, tell us a story, an incredible story. It's Shabbos. It's Shabbos. And in Yerushalmi, Chagiga, we're told, Yom HaKippurim Shechali is B'Shabbos. It's not just Yom Kippur, it's Yom Kippur that coincides with Shabbos. This is the context of the story and why I mention it today. So let's hear the story. It's a Shabbos afternoon, Reb Meir is giving a shir. And they tell him that his Rebbe, Elisha ben Avuya, is there, is outside. And Reb Meir interrupts the lecture. He wants to go hear his Rebbe. Elisha ben Avuya is horseback riding on Shabbos, which is a rabbinic prohibition, Mishnah Beit Salam Edvav. And you're not allowed to go horseback riding on Shabbos, Shema Yachtach Zmaira. You may uh, cut off a twig. And Reb Meir is now following Elisha ben Avuya, who's on a horse. And Elisha ben Avuya is giving a shear, a deep shear in learning to Reb Meir as Reb Meir is walking or running and Elisha ben Avuya is on the horse. And the journey continues. Elisha ben Avuya is on the horse giving a shear. Reb Meir is listening to the gems of brilliance coming from his great teacher's mouth who is violating the Shabbos. At some point, Elisha ben Avuya turns to Reb Meir and he says two words, Chazorbach, go back. Why? As I was horseback riding, as I was giving a shear, I was doing something else. I was counting the footsteps of the horse in the outskirts of the city. And I realized that we have reached Chum Shabbos. We have reached the border after which a Jew, an observant Jew, any Jew, is not allowed to walk on Shabbos 
the Alpaya Mama, the 2,000 Amas, let's say three or 4,000 feet outside of the city. I have counted the footsteps of the horse. This is Tchum Shabbos. This is where the border ends. Reb Meir is not allowed to walk any further. And Elisha ben Avuya, his Rebbe, wants to rescue him from violating the Shabbos. He says, Meir, go back. Chazorbach, you can't continue with me. Reb Meir sees the moment. And he tells his teacher, Af Chazorbach, you also return. And of course, his words have this dual meaning. I'm asking you to return geographically so you don't violate the Isra of Tchum Shabbos. But I'm also asking you to return existentially, spiritually. And Elisha ben Avuya says, I can't. I can't return. He picked up the quip. He understood the hint. He says, I can't. Why can't I? He t- shares a story. The story happened on Yom Kippur Shechali is B'Shabbos. A real Shabbos Shabbos in Yom Kippur and Shabbos. And Elisha ben Avuya was horseback riding. He liked horseback riding apparently. And where was he horseback riding? He went horse riding on the Harabayas, on the Temple Mount. Then the Harabayas was a real mountain before Adrian flattened the mountain, lowered it, and flattened it. But then it was a Harabayas. Remember, this is the Miliyu, the generation, right after Churban Bayusheni. It happened in the 70, after the Common Era. And he goes horseback riding on Yom Kippur, Shabbos, on the Harabayas. And I walk by. I, tr- I ride by the base Kotsha Kedoshim, the home of the Holy of Holies. And I hear a voice. I hear a baskel. And the baskel says, Shuvu bonim shuvavim. Chutz me'acher. Return, O mischievous children, except for acher. Reboi Shalom says, children, come back. Even those who have went astray. Come back, everybody come back. The Pasuk that we recite in our Tfilis of Yom Kippur. Come back. He tells Reb Meir, I can't come back. I can't. I was expelled from the Rushus of the creator of the world, Kavayachal. And according to the Bavli, according to the Talmud Bavli, Chagig, Elisha ben Avuya dies without repentance. And it's only generations later that they achieve his soul's entrance into Gan Eden. As the Gemara goes on to tell the story there, Chagig after Svav, you can look it up. I ask you, my dearest friends, a simple question, what they used to call in Yiddish, Haklotzkash. What's the meaning of a baskel? Shuvu bonem shayvavim chutz How do we reconcile this with one of the axioms of Judaism? That axiom that the Rambam formulated in his inimitable words in Mishnah Torah, Hilchus Truva, Ein Lechadavor Ha'imid Bifnei Truva, nothing stands in the way of Truva, based on a Yerushalmi Talmud Yerushalmi Mesech Tepeya. As the Rambam puts it in Hilchus Truva, Afilu Kafar Beiker Kol Yama Veshav Bacharayna. Even a Jew who denied the Rebbeinu Shalaylam's presence, he denied the very foundation of Judaism throughout his entire life. But at the end of his life, at the end, he did Truva. The Rambam says he's accepted, he's forgiven. As the Rambam says, even Menashe, the heinous king Menashe, the most evil king who reigned in Judea. The Gemara the Danach tells us he reigned for 55 years. And he did some of the most, he committed some of the most heinous, repulsive crimes. And even Menashe, this Rosh Merusha Menashe, son of Chizkiya Amalekh, but whose father could not, Educate him, as the Gemara discusses in Masechus Sanhedrin, and Masechus Brachus. He couldn't. Menashe was just, a, became a rotten apple. And even his tshuva, towards the end of his life, was accepted. Even Menashe. This is based on the principle, every person can do tshuva. The Yerushalmi says, the Yerushalmi, I think, in Masech Tekilayim, just in parentheses, interesting Yerushalmi, when it says in Sanhedrin, that Yeravim Benevat, Ein Lechelik Leilam Haba, the Yerushalmi says that once, there was Shreif in Eretz Yisrael and the body was burnt. Even Yerav ben Avot Yash Lechelek Leilam Haba. Fascinating Gemara. In any case, I ask you now a question. How do we make sense of this heavenly voice? Shuvu bonem shayvavim chutz mayach. The one exception in Judaism, Hashem says, you cannot be accepted into Truva. What happened to the Koyach HaTruva? 
What happened to the Ein Lechadovarim Dufnei Atshuva? What happened to the Yachpetz B'mois HaMeiz Kiyim B'shuva Midarkoi V'choya? As we say in the Slichas and we say in Yom Kippur, we say in the Ila. What happened to Tshuva suddenly? It's a famous, beautiful insight of the Shaloh. Rabbeinu Yeshaya Horowitz, the Shaloh, and I think even earlier the Reish is Chochma, Baliyo Dividash, who explained that the Gemara says, Kol ma shabalabayis oima lecha asei chutz mitzei. You come to a person's home. Whatever the balabaya says, you do. Besides tzeh. If he tells you to leave, you don't have to obey. So the shalah kodesh says, whatever the Rebbein HaShalem tells you to do, you do. He's the host. L'Hashem Ha'aretzim Loya. Chutz mitzeh. If he tells you tzeh, I don't want a relationship with you. Get out of my house. You don't have to listen. He told Elisha ben Avuya, tzeh, out. Chutz me'acher. He didn't have to listen. No. Push yourself in. You stay in the house. You stay in the relationship. Be tenacious. You cling to the relationship. Cling to truth. As they say in Yiddish, vanish this fall. Don't get distracted. Beautiful insight. But I'm asking a different question. What's the meaning of the Basque? Why is the Balabayis saying, say, leave? Tell Elisha ben Avuya, do tshuva. Do tshuva. True. His sins were serious. Yoda b'chvoidi. He wasn't just a ordinary person. He was no, one of the great tanoim. He was one of the great scholars of the generation. One of the people who went into the Pardus, who went into the spiritual transcendent orchard with Rabbi Akiva, with Ben Zoyma, with Ben Azai. Rabbi Akiva came out in peace. Ben Zoyma and Ben Azai, one passed away, and one was affected mentally. Elisha Ben Avuya Kitzitz Ben Atiyas. He was a great, great man with such potential. But the Rambam says even Menashe can do tshuva. Why was Elisha Ben Avuya rejected? My dearest friends, The words of Chazal are very precise. They're extremely meticulous. Every word is oizgichashman, is calculated. The same story that exists in Bavli, in Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, second chapter of Chagiga, exists in the Yerushalmi, Talmud Yerushalmi. Talmud Yerushalmi, the Rambam says, introduction to Mishnah Torah was written and edited a century before Talmud Bavli, by Rabbi Yochanan. He says approximately a century. Kemoy Meyashana, perhaps a little earlier. So if Talmud Bavli was completed in the 5th century or the 6th century, Talmud Yerushalmi is a century earlier. Approximately the 4th century after the Common Era. In Talmud Yerushalmi, which is written closer to the era of Elisha ben Avuya, and written by Rabbi Yochanan, from Eretz Yisrael, Rabbi Yochanan, in, in Yerushalmi, in Chagige, tells the story. There are a few differences. The, 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 the crux of the story is similar, is identical. But there's a few differences. I mentioned Yom Kippur Shechali is B'Shabbos. One very interesting difference, striking, what the Baskel said. In Talmud Bavli, you'll open up a Gemara Chagigit, after Svav, it says, the Baskel said, Shuvu bonem shoivavim, chutz acher. Come back, children, except for acher. In Yerushalmi, it's a different text. The Baskel says, Shuvu bonem shoivavim, Chutz me Elisha ben Avuya. Which one was it? Did the heavenly voice on Yom Kippur tell him, come back, everybody comes back besides Acher, or did it say everybody comes back besides Elisha ben Avuya? Now you might say, what's the difference? What's the difference? Acher, Elisha ben Avuya. Perhaps, suggested Rabbi Yosheh Ber Salavechik, perhaps in this subtle difference lay the answer. To our enigma. Did the Baskel say Shuvu Bonam Shavavim Chutz Meyacher? Did the Baskel say Shuvu Bonam Shavavim Chutz Meyelisha Benafuya? That's the question. Friends, I'm going to change the topic. I'm going to come back, Bli Nedda, but I want to change the topic. Just a few weeks ago, a little more than 10 days ago, I saw an article in the New York Times. I think it was September 7th, 2020. And they share a story there. They tell a story, a reporter tells a story. One that the New York Times defines as a scientific miracle. It intrigued me. It had to do with Israel. And it intrigued me. And I've come to read it and research it. Incredible story. Such an incredible story and such a source of empowerment during this year, this difficult year, as we are in the age of Corona, facing uncertainty, facing the conclusion of a difficult year, Tav Shin Pei, 5780, 
a year in which many lost loved ones, many suffered financially, physically, mentally, emotionally, and this future is still uncertain. May it be an amazing year. Shnas Rafua, we said today, Avinu Malkeinu Minama Geifu Menachel Asachel. And we all have a little more kavana when we say these words. It's not just the infectious diseases we read about from the 1300s and the 1700s and the 1600s and the 1800s and the early 1900s. Menama Geifu Menachel Asachel. And this story that just unfolds at the end of Tav Pei, for me, it was moving, and I want to share it with you. The story begins in 1963. <laughs> Actually, it begins in the year 73, but we'll get to that in a moment. The story begins the time of Elisha ben Avuya. <laughs> so everything is connected. 1963, Yigal Yadin and his team performed famous archaeological excavations in the famous world renowned fortress known as Metsada or Masada. That extraordinary fortress, a mountain that many of you have visited, maybe you even ascended it before sunrise to be able to see sunrise, Neitzachame, Davin Vesikin, in the fortress of Masada were Jews fighting the Roman enemy in the year 70 during the Churban by Yesheni, went into this fortress to protect themselves and managed, according to the Josephus, to remain there for a few years. They had a food storages. We know today they had mikvahs there and they created an infrastructure of Jewish life But unfortunately, the Romans managed to penetrate the siege, and according to the historical versions, at least of many, the Jews committed suicide rather than falling into the hands of the Romans when they feared they would be tortured, murdered grotesquely, sold into slavery. Josephus, Yosef ben Matisio HaKoyet, who was a Jew, and as we know, became an accomplice of the Romans and gave us the books of Josephus, who observed, apparently observed the siege, wrote records about that story, including the places where they stored the food. When Yigal Yadin is doing the archaeological diggings in Masada, more than 1900 years after the original story in 73, after the Kamen Era, three years after the destruction of the Second Base of Mikdash, something extraordinary happens. He sees Josephus was right. He finds storages of food 1900 years later in the places that Josephus described, and among the items he finds, dates of a palm tree. But not dates. <laughs> dates won't survive 2,000 years, he finds the seeds, the seeds of a palm date. That's what he finds. It's put away with other items in uh, Barilan University in Tel Aviv, and it remains there for 40 years. In 2005, that's 15 years ago, Israeli botanists decide to do an experiment. What if we would take these seeds found in Masada? from the year 73, and plant them, and create conducive conditions for a palm tree to grow, would we perhaps be able to actually taste the very same dates that our ancestors ate during the second Mesa Mekdash? Just like if you lived then and you took the date of a, you took the seed of a date and you planted it, you would have the very dates that were at that time eaten and consumed. Those dates we'll have. We have seeds from them. Of course, they didn't give it much hope. You have seeds that have been incubated, laying in a hole in the ground for 2,000 years. I mean, they're numb and lifeless and dead and seemed emaciated and dried. What, what are you going to do with it? Who plants seeds 2,000 years old? But, you know, Jews are stubborn. Am And they planted the seeds. As Professor Levy said, she was one of the botanist the researchers involved, she said, for me, the likelihood that anything would happen was null. I, de- I gave it not 1% chance, not 0.1% chance, 0.00% chance. I did not think anything would happen. We tried it, you know. You want to say that you tried it, but there was no uh, feeling or anticipation that anything uh, substantial can emerge from this. How shocked she and her colleagues were a few months later when they noticed a crack, a crack in the earth. A young sapling, a young palm tree began to develop. And some time later, the tree began growing and growing. And a few years later, it became a tree. They named it Misushelach, 
You know why Mr. Shalach? Because he lived 960 years in Parshas Bereshis and they felt this sapling deserves to be named Mr. Shalach. It's been around for 2,000 years. But then came disappointment. She realized that this was a male tree. So you'll have a trunk, you'll have branches, you'll have leaves, but it will never be able to produce fruit states. Disappointment. But she didn't stop. She went on to search for more seeds. And then one day, in the Judean desert, near Yericho, near Jericho, not so far from the Qumran caves where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 40s, she came across ancient dates that were even more ancient than the dates found in Masada that come from the era of the Churban Bayesheni. These, not ancient dates, ancient seeds of dates, dated back hundreds of years before those dates. And she decided, we're going for it again. We're going to plant these seeds. She did. Now, how often do miracles happen? Now she really didn't expect anything. We may got lucky once. We're going to get lucky twice. How shocked she was when these plants in the Kibbutz Keturah in southern Israel, Negev, it needs a lot of heat. Those were the conditions conducive, not so far from Eilat, that Kibbutz, the Negev, the south of Israel. After a few months, sapling emerged. And then... After six years, a tree with flowers. She realized this is a female, and she named it Chana. Hannah, Chana, for whom? The person we read about, Rosh Hashanah. The woman who couldn't have children, V'chana Akara, L'pnina Eli Yiladim, L'chana Ein Yiladim, and then Eli blesses her. She comes to the Mishkan, and she's blessed with the Navi Shmuel as a child. So she named this female date tree Chana, beautiful flowers. Now it's time for matchmaking. Now it's time for a shidduch. So they take pollen from the Mesushelach male. They pollinate the flowers of Chana. And they hope for the next miracle. And indeed, just a few weeks ago, the tree produced for the first time, beautiful, large, lush, handsome, good-looking, geschmake, gedichte, Delicious dates. But let me tell you about the seeds of Chana. The first seeds from Mr. Shalach came from the time of Masada, the end of Bayashani. These other seeds from the female date tree that produced the dates were dated, the idea, five, four or five hundred years before that, which means the fourth century before the common era. And they identified it as date as, as seeds that came from Iraq, from Bavel. This is, of course, the era of Churban by Yisrishin. When the Jews were exiled from Eretz Yisrael by Nebuchadnezzar into Bavel, into Babylonia, present-day Iraq, and the same century when they come back with Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel, the time of Haggai, Scharia, Malachi, the era of Purim, when Cyrus the Great gives the Jews permission to come back, and apparently they brought with them seeds and dates from Iraq that end up in Eretz Yisrael, including in the Judean desert, and now it came the time for the scientists to pluck the dates. And they surround the tree, and they pluck the first dates. Somebody makes a bracha, baruch atah Hashem alekeinu melech oilam, boire priya eitz. And then somebody makes a bracha, baruch atah Hashem alekeinu melech oilam, shechiyonu vikimonu vigiyonu lizman hazeh. They eat the dates. Resounding amen. And then one of the people there said, the Pasek, tzadik, one of the scientists, his name is Yosef Abramowitz, he said, we were so emotional, we started to cry so much that our tears could have, plant, could have watered and irrigated another tree. That's how emotional we were. I don't know when was the last time you saw somebody eating a date and sobbing, but I know why they were emotional. They were holding the very dates that Jews ate 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, Dates that really represented seeds that lived through Churban Bayis Rishon and Churban Bayis Sheni. They were eating those very dates that came 2,500 years ago, back to Eretz Yisrael, after they were exiled by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylonia. It seemed like the Beis the Hamikdash was destroyed forever, Jewish commonwealth is over forever, and Babylonia re- re- triumphed. But the Jews, 70 years later, came back, but only to be exiled again. Another Beis Hamikdash destroyed again 420 years later. And then hunted down and persecuted and murdered and scattered all around the world. And then in our generation, came back in the millions 
to our eternal homeland in Eretz Yisrael, found those very seeds, planted them, and could make a bracha with the double meaning both of a pre chadosh and a real pre chadosh, a pre that dates back so many years. And they're eating the dates that come from the time of Mordechai and Esther, Yirmiyah, Novi, and Yecheskel, Chagai, Scharia, Malachi, Ezra, and Nehemia. In my mind, that's a miracle. Because it's not just about the dates. First of all, they said that the dates were delicious. I only saw the pictures, so I couldn't. I didn't taste them. They said they were delicious, and they tasted like honey, like honey of a beehive, which is fascinating because the Torah says Eretz Zovas Cholov Udvash, Eretz Chitu Soy the Gefentein of Yemen, Eretz Eishem and Udvash. And Chazal say which Dvash is this? It's not the honey of a beehive. It's the honey of tomorrow. It's the date honey, and it said the tasty states tasted like honey, and they came from the time of Bayashani and Churban Bayash Rishon, and they tasted like honey of a beehive, which is why the Torah calls them Dvash, and it's of course one of the minim, Shaneshtabcha Bameret Yisrael. I saw one of the scientists tells the New York Times, she says it's a muzzle that these dates, these dates were so tasty and so delicious, it would have been embarrassing if they were horrible because our sages extol the virtues of the dates of Israel of that time and say how delicious and large they were. So she says, I'm very happy that they're delicious and large. But I thought to myself, ah, what a metaphor and a reflection of tzaddik atomo yifrach kiyo adam eitzah sodam, of the Jewish soul. If this is true about the Jewish date, how much more so is it true about the Jewish soul? You know, sometimes you look at a Jewish soul and it's been incubated for 2,000 years, for 2,500 years, or for 50 years, or for a century, or for 10 years, 20 years, and you look at it, and it seems lifeless. It seems Khalila dead, numb, apathetic, indifferent, dried up, emaciated. We sometimes look at ourselves or our loved ones, and it seems like the soul has been snuffed out. Or as Yecheskel says in his famous Navu of the dry bones, <coughs> at some is hayavacious. The bones have become skeletons and they're dry. And I'm not talking here only physically, I'm talking emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. Yeah, I may go through the rituals, Rosh Hashanah, Asa, Esmei Tshuva, Yem Kippah, Sukkot, Chanukah, Purim, Shachos, Mincha, Meirif. But I'm dry. I'm numb. There's so much stress in me, there's so much anxiety. We look at ourselves, or we look at our loved ones, or we look at other people, and we see a soul that seems to have been in the ground for thousands, or hundreds, or dozens of years, or a few years. And it's so dry, it's so dry. There's nothing there. <laughs> but look again. Look again. You could look at these seeds and say, they're dead. Look again. Take these seeds and put them back where they belong. Plant them in their natural environment. Give them sunlight. Give them water. Give them earth. Give them ear. Give them the nutrients that they need. And suddenly... These ancient seeds that have been declared dead for millennia will be vibrating with life, will be bustling with life. Isn't this true about every single one of God's children? Never, ever underestimate the deep spiritual vibrancy and depth in your soul. For every Jewish soul is a chelik elikami mal mamish. It's a fragment of the Rebbeinu Shalom, a piece of Hashem, a ray of infinity, a fragment of heaven on earth. Even if you look at a soul like yours or your child's or your grandchild's or your friend's child or anybody, and it seems emaciated and dry, don't fall prey to the external facade, to the external deceptions. Al tabet al mareyu, Hashem says Shmuel to Shmuel Anavi. Ki ya'odam yireleinayim Hashem yireleivov. Look deeper. Go deeper. Because just like those seeds, they had the DNA of 2,500 years of Eretz Yisrael and of Jewish history. And what does your soul have? Your soul has the DNA of 3,800 years of Jewish history. Avram and Sari, Yitzhak and Rivka, Yaakov, Rachel and Leah. Moshe Rabbeinu and Yeshua, Shimshin and David and Shleima. Yirmiya and Yecheskel and Amos and Chagai. Mordechai and Esther. The Zugis and the Tanoim and Amiraim. Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Yochan and Zakai. Reb Meir, Reb Yehuda, and Reb Shimon. The Rabbon and Svaroi, the Ge'oinim, the Rishonim, and the Achiroinim. And your matriarchs, your great-grandmothers of thousands of years, all live, epigenetics, they all live in your genes, all their faith and wisdom and resilience and fortitude and depth and commitment and sacrifice 
and spirituality and holiness and purity. It's all there. It's bustling there. It's embedded in the DNA physically and spiritually. We carry the genes of Maimed Har Sinai and we carry the genes of others and we carry the genes of of the Tanoim and the Amirayim and the Rishonim and the Acherayim. We may look in the mirror and feel that we're empty and dry, but look deeper. Give a Jew his or her proper sunlight. The Varimkite, the sunlight, the Varimkite of Yiddishkeit. Give them the water. Give them the earth. The humility and the vulnerability of a, of a davening. And with Mayim Shifri Chamayim Libech, Shifri Chamayim Libech, Noichach Pnei Hashem, as the Navi says. And miracles will happen. You will see a Tzadi Katomor, Katomor Yifroch. Keres Balvon and Yisgeh. Come back with me, my dearest friends, to Elisha ben Avuya, and I think everything will become clear. The baskel that came out of that fateful Yom Kippur Shecholiyaz B'Shabbos was saying something very comforting to this man. Shuvu bonem shayvavim, chutz The baskel was talking to him. The Rebbeinu Shalolim was reaching out to his child, Elisha ben Avuya, and he says, Come tzurik, come back. Tshuva means return. We translate it as repentance, but that's a little somewhat of an alien translation. The authentic translation of tshuva is return. Return to whom? Return to yourself. Return to your core. Return to your DNA. Align your outer life with your inner life. Return to your maker. Return to a hu ascha. Vayikainenecha. Keil mechoylelecha. The one who conceived you. Return to your tati to your mommy, to the Shechina, Eima Bonem Smech. Return to your own Atzmius, Lech Lecha, as the al says, go back to yourself. Lech Lecha, go to, go to yourself, discover yourself. Elisha ben Avuya, you're my child. Shuvu, come back. One of the most painful things for a parent is to be alienated from a child. It's one of those things that one has to avoid as much as they can. I would say that to sever cords with a child is something that we don't, we do not do. Maybe, maybe, maybe there are unique, exceptional circumstances. But absolutely exceptional your circumstances. 99% of the time, I never sever a cord with a child. And I'll tell you why. Because people say the child is causing me so much pain. If I cut the cords, I'll have an easier life. It's not true. The pain that your child is causing you pales in comparison to the pain that you will have if you don't speak to them again. If you cut them out of your life. That pain is far deeper, far more severe, and far more catastrophic for the child and for the parent, especially in our generation. Your boy Nishalaylam says, Shuvu Bonim, you're my child, Kum Tzadik. The Gemari in Kiddushin Lamed Vavam at Beis, Reb Meir says, Ben Kachu, Ben Kachat Amkruyim Bonim. You remain a child no matter what. The unconditional love is there, even if there's pain. And the Rajba says, Shal Shuvah Sar Rajba, I think Kuf Tzadik Dalit says, that usually in Shas, my Meir and Rabbi Yehuda, the Allah is like Rabbi Yehuda, but not there. In Kedush Shalom Edvav, the Allah is like Rabbi Meir. Whatever they do, they still remain children, unlike Rabbi Yehuda. And in Sifri, Parsha Sazinu, we see that Rabbi Yehuda, it seemed like, retracted and acquiesced to Rabbi Meir, which may be another reason why here we pass like Rabbi Meir. The Rajba says the reason is because Rabbi Meir has four psukim that support him. The Rebbein Shalom tells Elisha ben Avuya, Shuvu bonam, you're my child. Chutz meyacher. Chutz meyacher. Your sense of yourself as acher, you must leave outside. Elisha ben Avuya, you're my child. But one day, one dark day, this dibuk crawled into your psyche. And you looked in the mirror. And that day you decided you're not a child. You're not a child of the Shechina. You're not part of Am Yisrael. You're not part of the eternal covenant of Am Hashem. You're not part of Mam Leches Koyen and Begoy Kodesh. Bonim Atam Hashem Alekeichem Ahavti Yeschem Amor Hashem. Suddenly you looked at yourself and you identified yourself as an Acher. You're an alien. You're a foreigner. You're an outcast. You're not part of the golden, unbreakable chain of Knesset Yisrael that goes from Avram Avinu till Mashiach. 
suddenly you look at yourself and you say, I'm an Achir, I'm not part of these people. I'm part of a different culture, a different community, a different, a different civilization, a different empire. Elisha ben Avoyah, that's not true, you're my child. In your own perception, you define yourself as an Achir, as a stranger to everything your ancestors stood for, your Chaveirim stand for, your Talmidim stand for. You lost touch with your inner core. Shuvu bonim shayvavim kum The Baskal was inviting Elisha ben Avoyah to see himself as a child. Chutz meyacher. Except for the Achir, the Achir that you have come to identify with is holding you back. Leave that outside. Leave that pachutz. That's alien to you. The Achir in you is not welcome because it's not who you are. The child in you. Bring back. Come back. Ay, 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 ay. Comes to your Shalmi and says, it's not what he heard. He heard Chutz Melisha ben Avoya. You know, friends, there is what I tell you and there is what you heard me tell you. We all know in marriages, there is what you tell your husband and there is what your husband heard you say to him, right? Are the two the same? <laughs> two are not the same. What I say to my wife or what I say to my husband or what I say to my child and what they heard me say is not the same thing. Because I hear you through my own senses. I hear you through my own traumas and weaknesses and perceptions. I don't hear what you say. I hear what I thought you said. And that may be very different. That's why communication is so important to understand not only what you're saying, but what the other person is hearing. Elisha ben Avuya at that moment heard a baskel shuvu bonim shoivavim chutz meyachir like the Bavli says. That's what Hashem said. But you know what he heard? He heard a different message. He heard Shuvu Bonam Shaivavim, Chutzme Elisha Ben Avuya. Sadly, for him, the Acher became synonymous with his identity. There was no distinction anymore. This was the tragedy. For him, he heard Chutzme Elisha Ben Avuya. Hashem was saying, Chutzme Acher. Let go of the Acher. You're not an Acher. Get rid of the Acher. I want a child. He couldn't see himself anymore as a child. For him, the Acher became his identity. It's like what happens in trauma. What's the tragedy of trauma? People who suffer from trauma. And so many of us deal with one form of trauma or not. It becomes my identity. My self-image becomes so restricted. I operate on a level of consciousness that is extremely narrow, extremely traumatized, extremely small. My relationships with people, my relationships with myself, my marriage, my relationship with my children, my relationship with my coworkers, my employers, my employees comes from a very, very restricted, traumatized place because my brain is now operating from a level of trauma I don't see within myself a larger story, larger potentials, different possibilities. My neural pathways have been dictated, have been dictating me in a very limited direction. My choices are much smaller. I don't see myself as a child. I see myself as an acher. I heard chutz me'elisha ben avuya. Hashem didn't expel the acher. He expelled the Elisha ben Avuya. That was the tragedy of this individual. This is the discrepancy of the Bavli and Yerushalmi. One identifies what Hashem says and one identifies what this man heard. Isn't this a story about so many of us? Yom Kippur comes and there's a Baskel. There's a voice that's heard. There's a voice that comes from the base Kodesh HaKadoshim within every single Jew, the Yechidah Sheben Nefesh, Yechidah Liyachtach, the Atzmiyas HaNeshama of Ayid. Here's a Baskel. The Baskel says, Shuvu Bonim Shevavim. Come back, my child. And yet so many of us have this inner perception that I'm an Acher. I am messed up. I am traumatized. I got too many issues. I endured abuse. I had a difficult upbringing whether it's my parents to blame, my teachers, my community, this one, that one. I'm an alien. I don't belong. I don't have a relationship anymore. I'm a con artist. I suffer primarily from envy, from hatred, from sadness, from depression. There's so much fear in me, so much insecurity in me. That's who I am. I'm an acher, I'm an alien, I'm a foreigner. Comes Hashem on Yim Kippur and says, Chas v'sholem, shuvu, bonim, shayvavim. Let go of your perception of yourself as an acher. I want you to be able to look in the mirror and say, I am a child. I'm a chelik elikami mal. I'm a piece of the Rebbein Shalom. I'm a manifestation of infinity in this world. Who am I? Eved melech melech, says the Gemara in Shavuos. The servant of a king is the king. Yad eved ki yad rabbi. 
Shlucha Yishaladam Kemaisa, the Gemara says in Kiddush and Mem Aleph. A shliach, an ambassador, a messenger of somebody, assumes the status of the one who sent them. You are a shliach. The Rebbein, on Yom Kippur we say, what does the Torah say? Doimen Kemalachem. Jews are compared to a malach. What's the definition of a malach? What's Pshat a malach? Rashi says malachim. Vayishlach Yaakov malachim. Chazal say malachim are shluchim. Messengers. That's what a malach is, a messenger. A malach means somebody who identifies himself or herself as a shliach of the Rebbein Shalal, without any distractions. Who are you? Yom Kippur, Yedoyim HaKamalach. Every day you're a malach, but on Yom Kippur we try to internalize it, to breathe it, to live it. Who am I? Who are you? You're a shliach of the Rebbein Shalal in this world. You are his ambassador, you are his messenger. Shluch Shaladam Kamaisa. So you assume the properties of the one who sent you. You're not just your own lonely, lost soul. Chas I'm not a loser. Ashlamil, Ashlamazal, Anudnik. You represent the one who sent you, and therefore you're invincible. You're indestructible. At your core, you're full of sanctity, purity, holiness. You're invincible. You're full of possibility. You represent infinity. I am not my trauma. I am not my stress. I am not my anxiety. I am not my fear. I am not my insecurity. I am not my Yetzirah. I am not my jealousy. I may have these issues, I may have these skeletons, but I contain them, they don't contain me. I define them, they don't define me. Who am I at my core? Who are you at your core? You're a messenger of Hashem in this world, a manifestation of infinity, and therefore, you assume the properties of the one who sent you. He doesn't suffer from a lack of self-confidence, he doesn't suffer from fear, he doesn't suffer from insecurity. He represents truth and infinity and that's when you become that shliach. That's what you carry in yourself. That's what you represent. That seed, no fire can destroy it. No water can destroy it. After 2,500 years, it's alive and well. You just have to place it in the proper environment. Give it the water it needs, the air it needs, the sunlight it needs, the earth it needs. And your true DNA, your true self, your true core will blossom. Rabbi Yankele Galinsky. Rabbi Yankele Galinsky was a Navardic Talmud. He was a Talmud of Navardic. And uh, he was exiled to Siberia. And he once shared a Gavaldic story. He later moved to Eretz He was a famous Magad in Bnei Brak and other places. Geshmak Yid. Some of you maybe remember him. So a short Yidala. Very funny, very funny man. And he was, uh, he would say, it was beautiful Torahs and stories. And he once shared that when he was in Siberia. It's a fascinating story. He would wake up very early before dawn, before sunrise, before dawn, to be able to chapa krishma, davening, after Alois HaShachar, B'dyevet, B'Sha'as HaTchak, Sabiris, B'Sha'as HaTchak. Because afterwards they would be marched out to their uh, labor assignment in Siberia. And there was another man who would also wake up very early before the group, and he would get dressed in these aristocratic uniforms. He had these uniforms with medals and badges, and Rabbi Ankala said, what are you doing? And the man said... I was a general in the Tsarist army. And then, of course, after the Bolshevik Revolution, as the Tsar was dethroned and murdered, the Romanovs were murdered with their entire family, all the Kindelach, all the children. I, of course, was also dethroned, and I was accused of being a counter-revolutionary, and ultimately I was sentenced to Siberia, to Stalin's Gulag, but I managed to smuggle in with me my uniform from the days when I was a general. And every single morning, every morning, before I go out to work as a prisoner here in Siberia, I put on this uniform so I could tell myself, I'm not a prisoner. I'm not a victim. I'm not a victim of the cursed communists. I'm a general. I'm a general. I put this on, I look at myself, and I tell myself I'm a general. That's what I do every morning. The Bianca Galinsky said, that story inspired me for decades. I understood the calling of Yiddishkeit. I wake up in the morning, I put on a uniform. Every day. This is not hypocrisy. It's to tell myself who I am. I'm not an Acher. You're not a loser. You're not an outcast. You're not an alien. You're not evil. You're not a broken, shattered, miserable person. I may have struggles. We all have struggles. You're a general. You're a Ben Melech. You're a prince. Rabbi Aaron Karlina said the greatest tragedy is when the prince forgets that he's a prince. Instead of going to the Schmuggers board, he goes to the garbage dump to find some bones together with the dogs. You're a prince. You belong at the Shmogas board. Your community had a Rav, legendary Rav. You had, of course, Rav Ram Rice, Rav Ram Rice, who was, I believe, the first Rav to be ordained in the United States of America. 
came from Würz, Würzburg and came to Sheirith, founded Sheirith Israel and fought very hard for halacha, for Torah. One of the great spiritual leaders of your congregation, Sheirith Israel in Baltimore, was Rabbi Shimon Schwab, Zatzal. Yeah, I don't know if you know the story, it's a long Misa. But Rabbi Shimon Schwab, when he was a rabbi in Bavaria in 1933, at the age of 25, he was appointed as Rav in Bavaria. And in September, September 33, just a few months after Adolf Hitler, Yemach Shemoy, was elected as the Chancellor, as the Führer of Germany. It was Parshas Kisisa. And Rabbi Shimon Schwab gave a sermon. And there was a German spy, a spy of the Gestapo in Shul. And Rabbi Shimon Schwab quoted Rabbi Shimon Shimon Rafal Hirsch. And Parshas Kisisa discussing the Chet Egel that the Jewish people didn't want idolatry, but they were looking for a far Mittler. I don't know how many of you know a good Yiddish or a good German. Afar Mitle, they were looking for an intermediary between them and God. And of course, Rabbi Shimon Schwab said, Jews, da finished hobin kein mitle, kein far mitle. They don't need an intermediary. They don't need a calf. They speak to Hashem himself. But it could sound like the Yidden da finished kein far mitle. They da finished kein Hitler. And the Gestapo invited Rabbi Schwab, 1933, for an investigation. Did you insult Hitler in your sermon? And Rabbi Schwab opened up the German commentary of Rabbi Shimshon Rafal Hirsch, written in the 1800s, showing them that he wasn't talking about the Chancellor of Germany, he was talking about Afar Mittler, an intermediary between you and God. They told him, you're not off the hook, you need an investigation. Call back, and he would call back each week, and they said to call back and call back, and after a few months, he called the Gestapo. And finally somebody screamed at the phone, stop calling already! Your issue was settled. The man was very rude, but he realized the man was telling him, you're off the hook. And ultimately, of course, Sheirith Israel saved him and his family when he got the position in Baltimore where he served, I think, until 1958, and then he went to Washington Heights in Manhattan. But why am I sharing this with you? Fascinating piece of history. I'm sharing with you. He once said that those two months, those two months, when he was calling back the Gestapo, he was under their radar, being investigated for insulting the Tzera Yehudim, Haman Arash, Hitler, Yemach Shemay He did not go to sleep in his pajamas. Now for us Americans, that doesn't mean anything. We fall asleep on the couch in our clothes. Some of us even commit the horrible crime of going to sleep in our clothes. But for Ayeker, this is Yehorek Valyaver. Go to sleep in your clothes, not to go to sleep in pajamas. This violates all the rules of a good German Bavarian Jew who lives according to a disciplined schedule and etiquette. This was unheard of. You know why? He said because he heard of an acquaintance who was taken by the Gestapo in the middle of the night and hung in his pajamas. And Rabbi Shimon Schwab said something extraordinary. He said, I was afraid they're going to take me in the middle of the night and hang me as well. And the Jews tomorrow morning will wake up and see their rov hanging in pajamas. And that type of disgrace for German Jews would add insult to injury and would demoralize them even more. So he went to, I went to sleep in my royal garments. If Khalila they kill me, that insult should not be executed as well. And I realize it's really a Gemara in Sanhedrin, Sadiq Beis, the Gemara says, it says in Daniel, Chananya Mishal Vazari, when Nebuchadnezzar erected that golden statue, 120 feet height, 12 feet in the width, in the valley of Dura, the capital of Babylonia, and he had all of his subjects worshipping, bowing down to the idol, Chalam Yishov did not. And because of that, he cast them into a fiery furnace to burn them alive. And the Daniel describes at length that they were dressed in their royal, beautiful, brilliant, dazzling, glittering, aristocratic, royal garments. And the Gemara says, why is that necessary? They knew they're not going to bow down. They knew he'd probably kill them. Why did they come dressed up as that? They should have come in pajamas. And the Gemara says in Sanhedrin, and Rashi explains it, because it would have been a clap, a moral and embarrassing clap to the Jewish people. They would be thrown in as, as, as dejects, as losers. They had to maintain their royal dignity until the last moment to inspire that pride and dignity within every Jewish soul. Reb Shimon Schwab, your Rav, was following that example of Hananiah, Mishal, and Azariah. But what a lesson to each and every one of us. You know, sometimes we're beaten by life. Sometimes we go through difficult times. Sometimes we're going through a difficult parsha. Sometimes we're going through inner confusion, mentally, physically, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, with ourselves and our loved ones. Reb Simcha Binim of Pshischa once said, if you lose your money, you lost nothing. Money comes and money goes. If you lose your health, he says, it's serious. You lost half. You may have not lost your soul, but you lost part of your health. It's, very, it's, it's already of a different level. But then he says, but at least you still have a soul. 
You still have values. You still have convictions. You still have a personality. You still have a neshama. And then he said in Yiddish, But when you lose your courage, you've lost everything. When you forfeit your courage, you have lost everything. That the person can't afford to lose. My courage, the knowledge that I'm a child of the Rebbein Yishalem, the knowledge that essentially I'm good, I'm sacred, I'm holy, I'm infinite, I'm aligned with infinity, I'm aligned with Hashem. Don't see yourself as an acher, see yourself as a child. Yim Kippur, we say, And what that really means is, when I can align myself with lecha, when I realize that my deepest truth is my divinity, it's beautiful, it's amazing, it's full of righteousness. Shame comes when I detach myself. When I see myself as a lonely, isolated, neglected creature. When I don't see myself as divine, as powerful, as invincible, as a manifestation of the Shekhinah in this world. When I disassociate myself, that's where shame comes from. That's where toxicity comes from. I start looking at myself, I'm a problem case. I'm lim- so limited, I'm so confined. I'm in solitary confinement. Ayidav Hobben Stoltz inner healthy esteem that doesn't come from arrogance. It actually comes from humility. It comes from realizing who you are, who you really are, and what you can be. That's the essence of tshuva. It's the essence of Yom Kippur. It's the essence of Dirshu Hashem Be'imotzei Kra'u Be'yosei Karev. This time of the year, there's that baskel that still resounds, the same baskel that Elisha ben Avuya heard. We can all hear silently. And the baskel beacons us and says, Never, ever forget that you're a child. Let go of your perception of yourself as an acher, as an alien, as an outcast. You will never be an alien. You're always mine. You're always connected. You are always empowered. You are always uplifted. See it in yourself and see it in others so that they can see it in themselves. See it in your children so that they can see it in themselves. And when you see a seed that seems so dead. Remember, Yaakov Avinu Loi Meis, Mazari Bachayim Afu Bachayim. The Gemara says in Tainas Daf Hey, A Yiddish Azera, the seed of Nishmas Yisrael is Chayim. It's alive. It's vibrant. It's pulsating with physical life and emotional life and spiritual life. Atam Advekim Hashem Alekechem Chayim Kol Chem Ayoyim. May we internalize this Baskel. May we internalize it in our own lives, in the lives of our loved ones, the lives of all of our brothers and sisters the world over, and experience indeed a year, a shnas chayim, a year full of life, a year full of kiruv, a year full of hope and promise and infinity, a year filled with possibility, and of course a year of health, happiness, prosperity for you, for the entire community of Sheirith Israel, for all of Baltimore, for all our brothers and sisters in Eretz Yisrael the world over, for the whole world, Ashnas Refua, Ashnas Yeshua, Ashnas Geula, and Agmar Chesimetayva, Amen. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go to questions, right? So if you have a question, you can type it into the question and answer box, and I'm going to go to the screens and start with the questions. Question number one. How then does one reach out to someone who considers himself an acher, especially when he or she is in your very own family? That's a great question. Obviously, there's no generic answer and one size fits all. We're talking about a very individual question. But just on a very general basis, without knowing the people involved, it's just extremely important to maintain a connection, whatever that connection is. Maintain a powerful emotional connection. Again, depends on the age, depends on the situation, depends on the circumstances, but the, the, usually the common denominator is try as much as possible to maintain a connection. And not on your terms, on their terms. That means if it's your child, you want to spend time with them. If they enjoy hiking, go hiking. Bike riding is bike riding. Go out to eat, barbecue, exercise together, play games together, play football or frisbee together, study together, talk, chat, but connect. It's very important to hold on to that connection. If they like going for coffee, go out for coffee, go shopping together, whatever it is. It's so important that the conversation continues, and sometimes that's painful. And don't try to get into arguments and debates. They're usually futile, especially if it's coming from close family. Especially if you're a parent, it's not going to work. Much easier if friends can influence your loved ones. But you hold on to that relationship. That relationship is so, so important to hold on to, by hook and by crook, or by crook. 
What did Rabbi Yosha Ber say? Are your words an elaboration of his explanation, or is it something else entirely? So there's a sefer by Rabbi Yosha Ber called Chamesh Drashas. The original book was called Fear Drashas, and basically four sermons that he presented at conventions of Istadrus Arabonim and Mizrahi in the early 1960s. So this I saw in one of his Yiddish Drashas that was presented, I think, in Atlantic City in 1961 or 62. And over there in that Drasha, he speaks about this story with Acha and Elisha ben Avoya, and he makes this distinction between the Bavli and the Yerushalmi, Chutz me Acha and Elisha ben Avoya, and explains this in the that Acha was really seeing himself as Acher, and the Rebbeinu Shalalim was telling him, you're a child, and let go of your Acher. That's the nucleus of the idea, and I, I developed it and elaborated uh, on, some, uh, on some points. Okay, next question. What are the practical ramifications of what you're saying? I think the practical ramifications of what you say, what I'm saying is, don't be afraid. I think one of the practical ramifications of what I'm saying, don't be afraid of any of your emotions. In other words, a lot of thoughts come up in us. I'm miserable, I'm a loser, I'm not, uh, nothing is going to be good, my marriage is crumbling, my children's relationship with my children is horrible, um, I can't be successful, whatever, all these types of thoughts. Don't be afraid of, of any of these thoughts, of any of their emotions. You know why? You're bigger than them. You're stronger than them. You're more powerful than them. They don't define you. You define them. In Tanya, it says that machshavas are called levushim. Thoughts are called garments. The Rizal says, machshavas isis besimcha. The point is, we sometimes take our thoughts so seriously. They're only garments. You know what happens if my jacket is dirty? I take it off. doesn't mean I'm dirty. It means my jacket is dirty. And what if I can't take it off because I'm in the middle of a lecture? Okay, so I wait till I finish and then I take it off. When we have negative or toxic thoughts, we don't have to take them so seriously. They don't constitute your essence. They are garments. We remove them. We are not our thoughts. I transcend my thoughts. I have thoughts, but I am not my thoughts. So when you could start training yourself not to allow these thoughts of negativity and toxicity to take over your brain, that's a tremendous step towards tshuva. Tshuva, sometimes people associate tshuva with guilt and negativity. Tshuva is about liberation and emancipation. The Rambam says in Ilchus Tshuva, tshuva is about a transformation of identity. You become aligned with your infinite core so that you're not enslaved by your external limiting stories that you tell about yourself. You understood what I just said? You're not restricted and limited by the self-loathing stories you tell about yourself. You see yourself from a, in a grander way, from a grander perspective, from a larger perspective. Your horizons are extended. And by the way, it's true in neuroscience today. We know in neuroscience that we create neural pathways by addictive thinking. And then we become prisoners to those thoughts and to those behaviors. When we can start exercising freedom and start behaving and thinking differently, we actually create physically changes in our brain that then allow us to see things differently. Or as the Tzamech Tzedek said, Tracht gut wird sein gut. Positive thoughts create change in your inner life and your outer life. Next question. If you yourself feel like an Acher, how do you change that attitude? Excellent question. The first thing is awareness. When you wake up in the morning, tomorrow morning, you're going to say these words. What does that mean? I'm thanking Hashem for giving me back a neshama. What's this neshama that He gave me back? He gave me back a piece of Himself. Then you're going to say, I want you to meditate. Breathe in for a few seconds and meditate on those words. The neshama that you have imbued within me, tahirahi. Tahirah means it's pure, it's pristine, it's sacred, it's beautiful, it's wholesome, it's amazing, it's splendid, it's dazzling, it's brilliant, it's confident, it's joyous, it's optimistic. Tahirah in Aramaic, tahiru means light. The neshama you have given me is full of light because it's your light. You are a manifestation of Hashem. I am a manifestation. That's how you begin your morning. Now I know I have other stuff. I have a Yitzhahara. I have toxic stuff. I have traumas. I have this thing happen. This thing triggers me. Fine, I got it. But who am I? Who am I in my essence? I'm not an Acher. I'm a child. Yerusha is not a Shin Yerushus. Why? Because the Ben is the Av. It's Etzem Av. You are a piece of the child. So meditate on this. Take it seriously. Breathe it in. Internalize it. And that allows us to operate throughout the day from a much deeper, deeper place. Now, the other thoughts are going to come up. The Yitzhahara won't let you go so easily. 
Anything that happens, oh, you see, you see, you see. It's called confirmation bias. So many things happen and they confirm to us that we're an acher. I'm an alien, I'm a loser, I'm an outcast, I'm a sinner. And this is avoid this Hashem. You have to retrain yourself not to allow your thoughts and your brain and your life to be overtaken by those thoughts. They're normal thoughts, they're human, but they are coming from alienation. And I do not want to be in a place of alienation. I want to be in a place of dvekas. Next question. How does what you're saying go hand in hand with shivrin halev? How can you be embarrassed by your sins without feeling a little negativity about yourself? Beautiful, beautiful question. This is a beautiful word from the Belzeruv. The Belzeruv, Rabbi Aaron said, We say in Kippur, Hare anila fonecha kichli mole busho klima. I stand before you like a vessel filled with busha, filled with shame. So he asked, What's up, Shad? Hare anila fonecha kichli. Hare anila fonecha mole busha. I'm filled with busha. What's up, kichli? I'm like a keli filled with busha. Here, I have a keli. So it's filled with busha. I'm filled with shame. You tell somebody, I'm full of shame. What do you mean I'm like a vessel full of shame? Say, I'm moirid kevart. In halacha, if you know Masech Kalim or the laws of Tumah and Tara a little bit, they're not so, people are not so versed in them. But the halacha is, for a keli to be mekabal Tumah, it has to be shalim, it has to be complete, it has to be useful. So let's say I have a pitcher of water. Let's say I have a wooden pitcher of water, right? And there's a hole in it, so the water is now trickling out. It can't be used for water. It can't be susceptible to Tumah anymore because it's not considered a keli, it's broken. Unless I designate it to put in apples. If I put in apples, it's fine because it can have a little hole. But let's say it has such a big hole that even it's kamoitsi rima, even pomegranates will fall out. It's not a keli anymore. Even though it looks like a keli, but it's too broken, it's too shattered to be a keli. Halachically, it's not a keli and therefore it's not tamay anymore. Very interesting halacha. So the Belzer Ruf says that's the pshat in the davening, Rabbi Aaron Belzer. Hare ani lefanecha kichli mole busho chlima. For you to be a keli, you have to be wholesome. You have to have a sense of wholesomeness. If on Yom Kippur, I feel like a shattered loser, a nobody, full of guilt and shame. There's no truva then. It's trauma. What happens then is I feel that Yiddishkeit, my Yiddishkeit is based on so much negativity and so much fear. So basically, instead of having a relationship with Hashem that is empowering, my relationship with Hashem is coming out of a sense of such a shattered self-esteem and brokenness. And it's filled with guilt and negativity. And I wish I can escape it deep down subconsciously, if not for my fears. Even though it's Hashem b'simcha, Yiddishkeit has to be based on positivity, on simcha. You have to feel that you're a wholesome keli. You know why? Because your soul is divine. You're a chelik alikam imal. Malei busha. The problem is such a beautiful keli and it's filled with dirt. I want to get rid of the dirt. The concept of shivrim halev, lev nishbar, the Balatanya writes in a Sefer Torah, er, lev nishbar, what does it mean a broken heart? What's kind of broken heart? He says, a beautiful vort. He says, a Yiddish heart, umaltem es arlas levavchem, the Pasuk says. A Jewish heart is one with Hashem. There's an arlas halev, there's a foreskin that covers the heart. So you need to break through the foreskin. You have to create a breach in the wall so that the light could come in, right? A Jewish singer once said, I used to worship perfection, but now I look for things that have cracks because that's where the light comes in. When I have a big ego or I have a lot of insecurity or a lot of pompousness, so there's an arlas halev, there's a thickness and I can't experience vulnerability, I can't experience beauty, I can't experience love, I can't experience truth, because there's so many blockages. So you need to break through the heart, not to break the heart, to open it up, so you can experience Hashem's love, you can experience Hashem's light. When I'm traumatized and I'm full of blockages, I can't experience anybody. Even if you tell me a hundred times you love me, you say, Avas I can't experience it, I'm too traumatized. So what's a Lev Nishba? Lev Nishba means create a crack, a crack in the cover-up, so that you can let the light come in. You can experience something deeper than you. The tachlis of Shviris Halev is not to break people, so that they become broken, shattered people that have no esteem, no security, no confidence, and they just walk around internally shattered and miserable. Chas v'shalem. The concept of Lev Nishbar is, I want to create a breakage in my ego. I want to create a shvira in my nefesh abahamis. I want to create a shvira in my insecurity, in my trauma. I don't want they should take over my life. I want to create a crack so I can experience deeper light. Great questions. Next question. How could the Baskal have said that the Acher is not able to return? Even if it was not meant to be taken literally, there is room for misinterpretation. Listen, you're dealing with one of the greatest Tanoyim, who I guess who I guess understood subtleties. And the subtle message here was, Shuvu bonim shevavim chutz what, what the Baskal sounded like, I don't know. 
unfortunately, or I don't know if unfortunately, I don't hear baskals. I don't know what it sounds like. What does it sound like when Hashem gives out a baskal? I don't know. Is it a physical voice? Is it a spiritual voice? Is it, is it an inner voice? I, I can't answer that question. So exactly how the words were formulated, was it physical words? Was it a message that he heard? The way the Gemara describes the baskal is that this is the point. Shuva banim shevavim chutz meyacher. Acher is not welcome, but you're not an acher, you're a child. Of course, you're right, he misinterpreted it. How could you practically discover your infinite self when your life is fraught with challenges? Good question. Good question. The answer is, my dearest friend, because only one way. If you realize that every challenge is essentially a shoifer, it's an alarm clock to help you become more aware of what your avoid is. If you see your challenges as coming from the Satan and coming from some force in the world that has control over you, it's not going to work. You have to see all your challenges as part of your shlichus, as part of your journey. The Rebbeinu Shalaylam has given you tools and resources and sent you into certain places with certain challenges to be able to bring your infinite light into that place. So none of your challenges are a mistake. None of your challenges are just randomly cast at you. None of your challenges are there to break you or shatter you. Every single challenge you experience in your life, as difficult as it is, is here designed to help you flex your muscles go deeper into yourself for you or me to become aware of the issues that we have and bring light into that place. Never ever think of your challenges as divorced of your infinity. On the contrary, you were sent into those challenges as an ambassador of the Rebbeinu Shalom to bring infinity into those challenges. Now, this is not an easy perspective to live by because we're so often trained to see those challenges as just overwhelming and we are part of the problem. Never think that you are the problem. You are the solution. That's the key. Every day I have to ask myself this question. Am I the problem or am I the solution? I have a lot of challenges. Am I the problem or am I the solution? If I think that I'm the problem, I become the problem. When I realize I am the solution, my neshama is the solution. It's Hashem's soul that He sent down, Kivayachal, to this world to be the solution. So you have a challenge? Great, now you are the solution. You are the solution to that. I'll tell you a very, uh, for me, a very moving story. There was a president of Israel. His name was Zalman Shazar, the third president of Israel. He grew up, uh, he was named after the Balatanya, but he became a leftist, socialist, mapainik, first education minister of Israel, and then in 63 became the president of Israel. He once visited New York in January, Shvat, and it was one of those winters, oh, yeah, yeah, you don't know those scathing New York winter nights, with the wind, it could, it could get 15 below, 0, 20 below. And he, coming from Israel, he wasn't used to it. And he came to, he came to Brooklyn, he came to meet the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So they meet outside on Eastern Parkway, and he tells the Lubavitcher Rebbe in Yiddish, he says, Is that kelt? You guys in New York have such a cold? So Shnei Durek the Beiner cuts through all your bones, it paralyzes you. He's complaining, he's lamenting to the Lubavitcher Rebbe about the New York scathing winter night without skipping a beat. The Rebbe tells him, that's why Hashem sent down the neshama of a Jew to the world to warm up the cold and to light up the dark. So when I'm facing cold and dark moments of challenge, I have to think I'm the solution, I'm not the problem. But for this, you have to believe in your divine potential. You have to know it. Neshama shenasatabi tahayrihi. Do you have suggestions for a good book related to these steps of discovering your infinite self, your simcha? So much of Yiddishkeit focuses on tshuva, which is related to the negative things. I want to learn more about the positive. How do I learn more about the positive elements? It's, it's a great question, and the truth is both are necessary because it's important to be able to identify the negative and experience remorse, but it's also important, especially in today's day and age, to be able to identify the positive. So I don't have one book, but generally, the, 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 there's a lot of swarm of machshava, hashkafe, chassidus, that focus very much on the positive. The Baal Shem Tev and his students, a lot of their swarm focus a lot on this, on this component. So there's all these types of swarm, you'll find, you'll find the, these, types of, uh, the, these types of messages in them. You have to also know how to read it. Like you read Nefesh HaChayim, it was written by Reb Chaim Valozhna, student of the Vilna God. 
it's full of this idea that the, the power of a person, the dignity of a person, the godliness of a person. So some svarim of Musa are very, very harsh. They're very negative. And even there, if you know how to read them, you'll see this message. But it's important to read those svarim. Um, you have a diff- various sifri hashkafe, machshave, chsidis, that focus very much on these, on these positive, positive components. I want to ask you a question. How can we do tshuva on sins that we know we are going to commit again? <laughs> Listen, we, the Mishnah says, you don't say echta v'ashuv. I'm sinning and I'm going to do tshuva. But when I do tshuva and I'm sincere, the fact that I'm going to do it again doesn't mean the tshuva is meaningless and worthless. The Rambam says, but they already explained it means a higher level of tshuva. Or it means right now I have to be sincere that I'm not going to do it again. Now, why do you say you're for sure going to commit it again? Maybe you won't. Why do you say that? Why don't you identify what made you do it and maybe change that? Like, wh- why this victim mentality? Let's say it's a problem of gossip or it's a problem of, uh, of insulting somebody or it's an issue of addiction or laziness. Maybe you won't do it again. Let, let's, let's, let's believe in our power and our potential. There's a reason you're doing it again. Identify the reason you're going back to it and let's try to eliminate it. So I, I, I'm not such a pessimist. I'm sorry. And you know what? If, if you fall and you do it again, okay. So we get back up and we do tshuva again. How many times a day do we say, Why is it not a brachel of atala? How many times a day? You ask Hashem three times a day, even not Yom Kippur. We ask Hashem three times a day, right, for tshuva, and we say, Maybe Hashem says, this time not. It's a brachel of atala. Because we have no suffolk and svek sveka that when a Jew sincerely asks Hashem for forgiveness, Hashem says, you're forgiven. After Yom Kippur, I do tshuva, and then I fall and I fail back to my old habits. How do you move forward without feeling like you're back to an acher? You have to take out the old CD from your brain. Eject the old CD and put in a new one. The old CD is telling you that you're bad, 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 bad. Let's start giving ourselves a different narrative. You're not bad. You're not an acher. You're a piece of Hashem. I make mistakes. And the reason I make most of my mistakes is because I don't realize who I am. If you would realize how amazing you are, you wouldn't make these mistakes. These mistakes are coming from the fact that we don't realize how amazing we are. So start realizing that and start telling that to yourself. And when you make a mistake, learn from it. Don't become paralyzed. Learn from it. It's a beautiful vart from, uh, from Reb Simcha Binam of Pshischa. What do we do in Kippur after Ne'ilah? We daven Mayriv, right? What, how do we start Mayriv? You forgive sins. And then what do we do? Shmanasra. What do we say in Shmanasra? I don't understand. You just finished Ne'ilah. You did Shuvah. Everything is forgiven. Why are you saying Yechaper Oven? It's my Riv Mitzayim Kippur. Who sinned? Melev, you went home after Ne'ilah and you sinned. We go from Ne'ilah straight into my Riv. Straight into my Riv. And especially if it's Hayek Shashul, there's no delays. They don't go for a conversation between Nila and Mayrev. And all shuls, my life, my life, right into Mayrev. Where's the sin? What's the Urach of in Slach Lano? You know what he answered? He said the sin of Mitzayim Yom Kippur is that Jews sometimes don't believe that Hashem forgave them. That's the sin. A whole Yom Kippur comes and goes, and then I say, I'm still a mess, I'm still an Acher. That's the sin. What's the sin? The sin is you don't believe you're good. You don't believe you were forgiven. I still believe that I'm a bad person. That's a sin. Get rid of that. That you have to do tshuva for. You have to do tshuva for the fact that you always think you have to do tshuva in the sense that you're never good. You're never beautiful. You're never amazing. That's not good. Imagine if your child would feel like that about themselves and you. Hashem is your mother. Hashem is your father. Why do we think with Hashem it's the same thing? Imagine your child always feels inadequate. Child always feels they're never good enough. Why do you think Hashem thinks like that about you? He thinks you're amazing. He's your biggest fan. He loves you. He loves you the way you are. And he takes pride in what you can be. That's how you look at it. He takes pride in what you can be. It shouldn't come from a place of, of, of negativity. Next question. How do we avoid insulting people when we're being machmer and sakonis nefashis with corona? They're being lax and flippant. Can you yell at someone who's not wearing his mask properly? Can we ask him to leave Tfilah B'Tzibur? Listen, if there's a situation where somebody is endangering the health of the public, then we are obligated, and we certainly have the right, to take the precautions that we need in order to protect those who are older, the elderly and the vulnerable, from Khalila being affected. But always you want to try to do it in the most cordial and loving and respectful way. 
and that should be done. You know, we could we can we can create uh, guidelines and boundaries in our institutions, our shuls, our moizdes, where there are certain guidelines, and if somebody can't respect it and can't follow it, we could cordially and nicely ask them to please not come. So I don't think I think we should try to avoid insulting people and and screaming at people and 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 throwing out people in 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 a in a rude way unless it's absolutely necessary if there's a dangerous situation so pikuach nefesh comes first but of course we should always try to be cordial and respectful and we can explain to people listen you know i'm not telling you what to do in your own house but you're coming here to a public a public place there may be people who are older there may be people who are vulnerable there may be people whose immunity is not as powerful as yours and these are our guidelines. You may agree. You may not not agree. Nobody's forcing you to come. So I think I think that makes sense to most people, and I think most people can respect that. Even if I disagree, fine. But I'm coming to your shul. I'm coming to your school. You know, kol mashe balabais oim lecha say chutz mitzay. But if the say if the say is an issue of pikuach nefesh, it's not just the balabais. You know, is, is uh, having a bad mood. So I think most people can understand it. So again, and and I think we have to. It's very important not to uh, surrender here to politics and to agendas, and to egos. There's only one consideration. Consideration is, the Rabbi Nishalaylam says, we have to protect our health. And that's our consideration. Never an ego issue. It's not a Trump issue. It's not a Biden issue. It's not a Democ- Dem- Democrats. It's not Republicans. It, d- this should not occupy space in, in minds of intelligent and caring people. There's only one agenda, and one agenda only, and that is to safeguard the health of people. If sometimes it's an exaggerated situation and it's not necessary, we could be honest about that too. Obviously, there's dinah de malchus dinah. So these are things that Rabbonim, Bale Halacha, who are responsible with the partnership of doctors and physicians who are responsible and caring people, make decisions and make guidelines. And everyone should be respecting those guidelines. And if somebody is not, they can be told in firm but cordial ways that this may not be their place. That's generally how I would, uh, how I would respond to this. What do we do about worry and fear and stress and anxiety? That's a good question. (laughs) They say that worrying is like a rocking chair. It keeps you busy, but it gets you nowhere. What we do about it is as follows. Every situation is unique. There are people who have very, very serious anxiety, and they need help. You may need vitamins. You may need to change your diet. You may need a little medicine. You may need to work with a nutritionist, a therapist, a doctor, a a psychologist, a psychiatrist. Sometimes it's very, very serious, you know? There's different approaches, there's different methods. Many of us don't have this serious level of anxiety that paralyzes us, but we just have general anxiety. And for this, you should learn chayvah salavavah shar habitachin. You should learn how to cultivate a good relationship with Hashem. You should cultivate a better marriage so you could speak to somebody, good friendships. And... Put yourself every morning, meditate, exercise, eat healthy, live in a more uh, expansive space, live in a more expansive consciousness, live in a more powerful world, in a, in a bigger world, in a broader world, in a godly world, the world that we spoke about before. You're a shliach of the Rebbe Nishalaylam. And when I'm suffering from anxiety, I have to tell myself, I am the solution, I'm not the problem. The anxiety is inside of me to make me aware of ways to grow, to make me more aware of myself. So don't become a victim of the anxiety. You define the anxiety. Don't let it define define you. What about betachin is wonderful, holiness is wonderful, but how do I remain, how do I remain positive? I'm scared of Yom Kippur, I'm scared of Elul, I'm scared of Rosh Hashanah. How can I use that, this time properly without feeling so scared? The answer to this is the Yisoyed HaYisoydis of Yiddishkeit. And I know, unfortunately, not everybody knows this, but it's so important. The Yisoyed HaYisoydis of Yiddishkeit is the last Nevuah of the last Novi, Malachi. Ahafti Eschem Amr Hashem. Hashem loves you to pieces. Hashem's love to you is infinite. It's unconditional. It's non-negotiable. And it's non-destructible. It's non-breakable. Nothing that you do or don't do will take away His relationship with you. His caring for you. The judgment of Rosh Hashanah, the judgment of Yom Kippur is always a judgment that comes from intense love. Hashem wants you to have the best year in the world. He wants you to have the most successful year, physically, spiritually, emotionally, socially, financially, in this world and in the next world. Everything Hashem gives us for the year is putting us in a position where we can flex our muscles, actualize our potential, 
live life to the fullest and fulfill our mission in the world. You are a partner of Hashem. You're a co-creator with Hashem. Don't look as Hashem as this big scary guy in heaven with a long white beard. So, okay, you know, life, death, life, death, life, death. It's a very scary feeling. Look at Hashem as your loving best friend. My sister, my spouse, my dove, my twin. He loves you. He rejoices with you. He wants you to have the best life. He created you. He's not here to create you and then judge you and kill you and take vengeance from you and, take, and be angry at you. That perception of Hashem doesn't come from Judaism. It's a, it's a misreading of all the tefillahs and the whole Tanakh. The foundation of foundations, the Yisoyed HaYisoydis is that the Rebbeinu Shalolam, as the Baal Shem Tev said, loves every Jew infinitely more than a parent loves an only child. The Zohar says in Parash Shmois, if you would know how much Hashem loves you, you would pursue Him with more alacrity, swiftness, and ferociousness than a lioness runs after her prey. If you would only know how much He loves you. The whole, these days are an opportunity for His Skarvus to realize who you really are. You're divine, and you could live that way. And Hashem is judging you to be able to give you the opportunities this year for you to be able to fulfill your mission. These are the messages that have to dominate your brain. And we're extricating the evil from us, not because we're evil, because we're so good and we don't want to have things that are toxic because toxicity doesn't belong to you. You're too good to be toxic. You're too good to be bad. You're too good to have a foul odor. You're too good to be immoral. You're too holy. You're too beautiful. You're too sacred. You have to recognize the wholeness, the wholeness inside of you, the wholeness of your keli. What's the key to loving Torah? What's the key to loving Hashem? And one more question. Why do Chazal say that if you're Mavatal Torah, you're served boiling coals that doesn't seem loving and nice to me? These questions are so important. You know, David, these questions are so important because there are hundreds and thousands of Jews who are dealing with this. And everybody has this impression of Judaism as so negative. It's like, it's so sad. It's so sad. I wish you could learn some of the svarim that I learned. <laughs> you have to learn some of the svarim of the Balatanya, of the Balshamtev, of the students. You have to see the whole different dimension. It's really all the svarim. It's all the svarim. It's the basis of Yiddish. You have to know how to read them. You have to... Okay, so let me answer you very brief. And I think, uh, David, we should stop here after this question, no? Unless you want to go till Slichus. Unless you want to go till Slichus. Because the questions... The questions are coming in, so uh, unless we want to go till slichas, which may be, which may not be a bad idea. Uh, so here is the deal. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Okay, how do you think about it? Hashem created you. He created us. He gave us a yitzhahara. He gave us challenges. He knows that we're going to fall. And now when we fall, Hashem says, "Okay, time for revenge. Time to punish these guys." Does that make sense to you? Is this a Judaism that you can accept? Isn't that weird? He creates you. Why did he create you? He created you to sin so he could punish you and put you in Gehenna and you could burn in purgatory for years and he tortures you. What type of God is this? What is this, a normal God? He creates you with challenges. You didn't make you Yetzirah. He made it. The Gemara says in Sukkah, he made the Yetzirah. He put you in a difficult situation. He gave you a Yitzhar. He gave you challenges. A lot of the trauma you're dealing with doesn't come from you. It came from things that happened to you. And now you make mistakes. Like, okay, time to kill this guy and make him burn. Oh, he didn't learn to... Does this make sense to you? You think this is a Judaism that an intelligent person can accept? Doesn't this sound weird? Imagine, forget about Hashem. Imagine your mother would say this. Your mother gives birth to you. And your mother says, you know, the moment my child sins... I'm going to cut him up into pieces. I'll fry him. I'll torture him. Does this make sense to you of a mother, a father? Unless you have a crazy, dysfunctional mother and father. Some, you put these parents in prison. Even if your father punishes you, if there's sadism and barbarity and torture, you say this father is an abusive man. He has to go to prison. He's a killer. And yet when it comes to Hashem, this is what we all believe. Does this make sense to you? I'm challenging you. You answer this question. I don't have to answer. You answer this question. Sadly, we often are very, very misinformed about this. We do not know what punishment means. 
We do not know what it means. Let me tell you what the Baal Shem Tov said about Gehenna. Okay? This is in Toldus Yaakov Yosef. For me, this was a, a game changer. Let me tell you what he says. He says, it says, Kel Nekames Hashem, Kel Nekames Haifiyah. God is the God of revenge. The God of revenge has appeared. How do you understand this? Hashem takes revenge, right? Why did it say Kel? It's Midas HaChesed. Nekames Hashem, Yud Kevavke, it's Midas HaRachamim. Wrong name. And why did it say twice? Kel Nekames Hashem, Kel Nekames Haifiyah. And he says, Kel Nekames Hashem. Hashem's revenge is all love. You know how he takes revenge? Kel Nekames Haifiyah. He appears in your life. And I'll give you a marshal from the Baal Imagine you're in the dumps and this kind, kind man schleps you out of the dumps and gives you everything. He puts you on his, your feet, gives you security and shelter, literally saves your life and gives you amazing blessings. But you don't know. And when you grow up and you become independent, you start persecuting this fellow. You do bad things to him. You curse him. You demean. You uh, denigrate him. You insult him. You hurt him. You harm him. So the Bashan said, "You know what the greatest nakam is? Haifia. When you suddenly experience the love of this person and you're embarrassed, you tell yourself, "Oh my God, how can I do this? That's the greatest revenge. The greatest revenge is not that he punishes you. The greatest revenge is you suddenly realize how good he was. All these years." You were angry at him. You were cursing him when he was the best thing you had in your life. He, you owe him everything. You know, sometimes in a marriage when you're traumatized and your wife is trying to love you and every time she loves you, you throw another psychological rock at her because you don't know how to experience the love and you think for sure she's trying to hurt you because you don't know how to interpret love. The greatest nakama in the world is the bush of the shame I'm experiencing when I realize, oh my God, this God who's so close to me, I'm a piece of him. And I backstabbed him. That's the most painful thing in the world. In other words, what he's saying is, you know what Gehenna is? And you know what Gan Eden is? I come up and I see two videos. One video is how I lived. And one video is how I could have lived. Who I really am. All the failed opportunity. How I lived in such a small, tiny place. For the person whose video of how they lived and how they could have lived match. It's Gan Eden. And for the other person... There's such deep hurt and shame. That's Kael Nekama is Haifia. He appears in your life. So what is Gehenim then? Gehenim is cosmic therapy. You know, if you have deep pain in you and you go to a therapist, what does a therapist do? He helps you spit out the pain. Does it hurt? Yeah. You cry and you sob. Is it bad? It's not bad. It's healing. Gehenim is cosmic therapy, divine therapy. It's painful. Sometimes it's fiery. But it's is not taking revenge. He's not trying to take revenge because he hates you. He's trying to heal you. Your neshama is divine. It's holy. But sometimes I tarnish my soul. I make it dirty. I make it filthy. It's now filled with creases and dents and traumas and blemishes and defects. And it can't be itself. So you need therapy. So I can go to therapy in this world. That's called truva. Or I go to therapy in the next world. That's called Gehenna. What is Gehenna? Gehenna is the pain of spitting out all the dirt all the filth, all the lies, all the deceptions, so the neshama could go back being what it is, a chelik elikam imal. So Gehenim is not that God is going to take revenge and kill you and torture you and put you on these hot coals. Generally, souls are spiritual, so there's no physical Gehenim. It's a metaphor. When we speak about fire, snow, it's metaphoric. It's all metaphoric. It's a metaphor of various forms of divine therapy to help a soul cleanse itself, spit out, the dysfunction, the spiritual trauma, so that the soul could become what it always was. Of course, I want to do it in this world, because this world is the ultimate place to do it. The transformation happens in this world. Therapy in the next world is a whole different form of therapy. But that's the idea. That's the idea. You know, you have beautiful clothes and they become dirty and smelly. You put them in a washing machine with chemicals and water. You're not trying to punish your clothes. You're not trying to destroy your clothes. You want to give them the fresh soft smell that they had. Hashem is never trying to destroy you or torture you. He loves you, loves you, loves you, loves you like a child and more than a child. It's an opportunity for you to be able to reach your ultimate potential. Don't be scared of a God. Your God loves you. Yira doesn't mean fearing because Hashem chas is a tyrant. Yira's Hashem means I'm afraid 
to ruin such an amazing relationship, such a beautiful relationship. That's what year is. I'm afraid to ruin such a beautiful relationship. And when you meditate on these things, you learn about these things, you could come closer to Hashem. You develop this type of love, love for yourself, love for Hashem, love for every person who's in the image of Hashem. And therefore a love of Torah, a love of mitzvahs, which is a way of exercising this intimacy with Hashem. If you want, if those of, those of you who want, I have a lot of shiurim on these topics, a lot, a lot of shiurim on these topics. If you go to the website, theyeshiva.net, T-H-E-Y-E-S-H-I-V-A.net, N-E-T, theyeshiva.net, <coughs> you'll see I have a lot, a lot of shiurim on these topics, which you may want to explore because I think they may help you um, in this growth, in this growth. I love hearing these questions and hearing your astute answers. Okay, I thank you very much. That's very nice of you. Next question. This is refreshing, inspiring, and very, very positive. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. Everyone, everyone can relate to what you're saying. It's really, really beautiful, and we really have to hear it. Thank you. I really thank all of you, and I want to thank uh, again the Marida Asra Shlita for the COVID. I want to thank David. Reb David, my dear friend, and I want to thank the board of directors, all the sponsors, everybody involved in this evening. Achir and Achir, I want to thank the whole beautiful community of She'erith Is- She'eris Yisrael, She'erith Israel, Shmer, She'eris Yisrael, Val Yoved Yisrael, Aymrim Shema Yisrael. And may all of you have a good gebenched yar, Agmar Chesim I send you my love and blessings for the most amazing, wholesome, happy, healthy, prosperous year, overflowing with bracha v'hatzlocha ad bli dai, ashnaz ge'ula v'yeshua, an agmar chsime toiva, lonu u'lechol beis Yisrael. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everybody, very much. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Jacobson, very, very much for your beautiful drasha. And the Q&A after, thank you for the suggestion that we do this. And uh, it was very, I'm not sure which was better, the drasha or the Q&A after. Q&A is always, Q&A is always better. It's the mitalmida yoysim ikula, mitalmida yoysim ikula. Right, right. So we appreciate your words and your time, and uh, you should have a good, good event here as well. Amen, Gamata. Amen, and Chevra, I want to tell all of you, this is a time where it's very important for every person to be a leader. You know, we can be victims and we can be leaders. Whenever we live in such times of crisis, it brings out the worst in people and it brings out the best in people. We have seen what happened in different cities over the United States, you're very familiar with, in the last few months. This is a time to bring out the best in people, the best in you, the best version of yourself. Be a leader. Be a leader to you, to your spouse, to your community, to your children, to your loved ones. Display leadership, courage, selflessness, generosity of spirit. Give people chizuk, empowerment, inspiration. This is very unique times, and our grandchildren are going to want to know, what was Pesach, Shavuos, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur of 2020 like? You want to answer that you were at the forefront of the children of Kalal Yisrael who were there to be proactive, to be a source of inspiration, clarity, and hope and resilience for people. Chazak, chazak, v'nis chazak. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.